Good evening. I'm Jan Newharth. And I'm Peter Pritchard. And we're thrilled to welcome all of you to our third annual Free Expression Awards, recognizing and celebrating free expression and those who champion it around the world. If you haven't started eating yet, please begin. If you'll indulge us for a moment, we'd like to tell you a bit about our organizations. The Freedom Forum, which is dedicated to free press, free speech, and free spirit for all people, is a nonpartisan foundation that champions the five freedoms of the First Amendment, religion, speech, press, petition, and assembly. The Freedom Forum is also the creator and principal funder of the museum. The museum is an award-winning museum dedicated to helping the public and the media better understand one another. While we celebrate our right to a free, unfettered press, we also recognize that those in the media have a responsibility to be fair to those that they cover. Just last week, we celebrated our 10th anniversary in this beautiful landmark building on Pennsylvania Avenue. During During those 10 years, we've welcomed more than 8 million visitors, and we'd like to think that most of them left happy and better informed about the media. Last year, we were named the best museum in DC by Washingtonian Magazine. This year alone, the museum has opened three major exhibits, one on the civil rights movement of 1968, an innovative photo exhibit on the Tet Offensive, a turning point in the Vietnam War, with tactile images that allow you to hear the voices of the Marines who fought there, and a 75-year retrospective of Pictures of the Year International, one of the world's oldest and most prestigious photo competitions. We've also added an exhibit on fake news and hosted public programs with White House correspondents April Ryan, Jim Acosta, and John Roberts, and media critic Howard Kurtz on the Trump administration's relationship with the press. One of our priorities is newsroom diversity, and in January, the Newseum Institute, the education and outreach partner of the Freedom Forum and Newseum, launched the Power Shift Project to combat sexual harassment and promote workplace integrity in media organizations, hosting a summit with leaders from across journalism and the media industry, and a series of training sessions designed to create transformative change for women in the news industry. Through the Museum Institute's Museum Ed program, students and teachers can take classes on site or online on such topics as fighting fake news, civil rights, and media ethics. Museum Ed now reaches more than 10 million students in 175 countries around the world. The Institute's Religious Freedom Center hosts graduate level courses on religion in the public square to educate religious and civic leaders, just one of the center's many programs that promote religious liberty and literacy. The Museum Institute also hosts the Chips Quinn Scholars Program, dedicated to increasing diversity in the media, and the Al Newharth Free Spirit and Journalism Conference, which each year brings rising high school seniors to Washington for a week-long conference on journalism, public affairs, and the lifelong value of being a free spirit. The program is named for my father, Al Newharth, the founder of the Freedom Forum and the Museum, who championed First Amendment freedoms and diversity in media throughout his long career. Here's a look. Yeah, let's <laughs> give Al a hand. That's a good idea. <laughs> Here's a look at some of the highlights of the first 10 years of the museum in Washington, DC. This museum is by far one of the great attractions in Washington, D.C. Two, one, go! Oh. President Kennedy died at 1 p.m. Central We Standard were able Time. to record important aspects of the war that historically were significant. Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. Something else just hit. There's been another collision. Oh my God, there it goes! There's been an explosion at the Boston Marathon. There's something about the still moment. 
that moment in time that does touch people. Justice too long delayed is justice denied. It's our opportunity to remember a group of journalists who were willing, in many cases, to give their lives in pursuit of the truth. We honor him now, not only by our words, but our deeds. Austin Tice, the missing American journalist kidnapped in Syria. The museum wants to encourage people to consider what their world would be like without journalists to bring them the news. The majority of the world's population lives in countries without a truly free press. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Why can't we just have the truth? I have such great, undying respect for journalism and journalists. Somewhere I read that the greatness of America is the right to protest far right. Speak up, speak out, make some noise. Now, it's our honor to introduce the trustees of the Freedom Forum, the museum, and the Museum Institute who are with us tonight. Please stand when you're introduced, and we'll hold our applause until the end. First, the chair of the Museum Institute, Jim Abbott. Next, Shelby Coffey III, the intrepid editor. Next, Michael Coleman. Next, Phil Curry. Next, Murray Garnick. Felix Gutierrez. George Irish, Jack Kirschenbaum, John Lee, Karen Appleton Page, Jennifer Preston, Orge Quarles, Mike Regan, John Michael Siegenthaler, and Judy Woodruff. And our trustees emeriti, Madeline Jennings, Will Norton, and Charles Overby. And finally, Museum President and Chief Operating Officer Scott Williams and Museum Institute President and Chief Operating Officer Gene Polisinski. We are so grateful for the leadership and guidance that our trustees provide and to all of you for supporting our mission to champion free expression and the First Amendment by being here tonight. And now please join us in welcoming to the stage Senator Mark Warner. Well, thank you, Jen. Thank you for that kind introduction. And let me say it is a real pleasure for me to be here, to be on the honorary committee. I know we've got lots of distinguished journalists and technologists in the room. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, one of my dear friends who I have the honor and privilege of serving every day with in, in the United States Senate. That is the great senator from Minnesota, Amy Klobuchar. <clears throat> now, I was told I have one minute. You ever seen a politician with one minute? It doesn't happen. Let me, but I do want to make a couple of very quick points. First. First and foremost, congratulations to all the winners. What you do, what you do now more than ever in terms of celebration of a free press and freedom of expression is more important than it has ever been. It's a bit of a truism, but let me assure you, from where I sit and where I live, we are in uncharted waters. I think about the fact that as somebody who spent longer in technology than I have actually in politics, although that's shortly about to flip the other side, we have seen how with the power of a single click, you can now spread information or news, real or not, all across the world in ways that have been totally unprecedented. Jan, your comments and your, your, and your dad's commitment to this uh, enterprise is so terribly important and as you go through some of the educational entities that you, you're working with here at the museum I feel like I've kind of gotten a graduate course in this issue over the last 16 months as the vice chair of the Senate Intelligence Committee where we've seen a foreign nation in the country of Russia use basically 
our openness as a society and our own technology in ways that have actually been used to sow division and spread discord in our country. Through the use of fake accounts, automated bots, some paid ads, we've seen our very tools of technology that in many ways have connected us together be used as ways to sow discord and division in ways that are unprecedented. And we as a nation are still trying to get our arms around what in effect was 2016 technology. We think about a world where very shortly any person of, of note, from a politician to a newsmaker, it may be their image or their face could be put on another individual's face, or our words that are coming out of our mouth can be manipulated in ways that are unprecedented. So the notion of what you do is more important than ever. And the truth is, particularly to the journalists here, in America, you have always been branded as, in a sense, the fourth estate. Your job is to keep us accountable, to tell the truth, and I'm going to take advantage of one of those freedoms of expression. I know this is a nonpartisan uh, notion, but this cause is not served by a president who wakes up every morning and tweets out broad attacks against the integrity of journalists across our country. And it's for those reasons that investigations need to conclude, the American people need the truth, and we need to be prepared to move forward. The fact is, there is real news. The fact is, there is discernible truth. And your job and your role in ferreting that out and holding us accountable is more important today than it's ever been in my lifetime. So again, congratulations to all the winners tonight. Keep up the good fight. Congratulations as well, and thanks to all the folks on the committee who have made this dinner possible. And now, that was a relatively short one minute. Enjoy your evening, and again, have a great evening. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your host for the evening, former anchor and correspondent for NBC News and Newseum trustee, John Siegenthaler. Welcome, welcome to all of you tonight. Um, I'd like to begin with some sad news. Some of you have uh, taken a look at your telephone tonight and, and learned um, about the passing of one of America's most respected and admired individuals, uh, former First Lady Barbara Bush. She was 92. I thought we might just uh, take a moment of silence to remember Barbara Bush and her family tonight. So good evening and welcome to the museum, what some of us call the mother church of the First Amendment. Um, since Al Newharth founded the museum. As Jan said, its, its mission has been to educate the public about the First Amendment, about free speech, about free expression, and a free press. It's one of the reasons he chiseled the 45 words of the First Amendment in stone on the front of this building outside. It's also why Al established a memorial in this building, right up on that wall, to remember those journalists who were killed, died reporting the news, doing their job. Over the years, as you all know, there have been many challenges to a, a free press in this country. But I suspect that even Al could not have imagined the troubling times we face today, the challenges we face today. These are troubling times. This administration's relentless assault on journalism is a very real threat to the First Amendment and a free press. If you look up at that wall and look at the names, think about the journalists who died doing their jobs. And look around this room tonight at the journalists who may be at your table, some of them former journalists, some of them you know, some of them you don't know. 
Despite what you hear from our president, those men and women, those journalists are not fake. Their stories are not fake. They're not scum, they're not slime, they're not disgusting, they're not phony. They are not the enemy of the American people. Every day they deliver fact-based news and information to help citizens make informed decisions about our country and our government. They deserve our support. We need to stand up for them and stand up, stand by them through these difficult times because the free press is under attack and we must do everything we can to protect it and defend it. So it is appropriate tonight that we celebrate the First Amendment with these free expression awards, recognizing people who exhibit a passion for free speech, people who have taken personal and professional risks to share critical information or challenge injustice, and people who have been censored or punished for their work. Let me just first mention that your support of the museum and the Free Expression Awards allows us to continue our mission to educate the public about the free press and the importance of the First Amendment. And tonight we'd like to send our special thanks to Altria and the New York Times for their goal level sponsorship of these awards as well as all of our silver sponsors of this event. Thank you very much. We're here tonight to celebrate some remarkable individuals. The publisher of the New York Times, who guided the most respected newspaper in the world through the challenges of the digital age with innovative and important journalism. To Olympic athletes who protest for human rights in Mexico City set off a firestorm 50 years ago that still resonates today as NFL athletes take a knee to protest injustice against African Americans. The editor of a French newspaper who survived a terrorist attack that killed eight of his colleagues and carries on their work while remaining under a death threat. And the journalist whose tenacious reporting launched a reckoning about the mistreatment of women in the American workplace that reached from Hollywood and the Olympics to the halls of Congress. So let's get started. We're going to begin with the Lifetime Achievement Award. Through the era of terrorism, wars, and the seismic shift in the news industry, Arthur O. Sulzberger, Jr. has led the New York Times with a journalist's passion for news and a visionary's eye to the future. In 1992, at age 37, he was named the publisher of the Times and chairman of the company five years later. Arthur continued to expand the newspaper's reach far beyond the New York region, solidifying its reputation as a must-read for national and international readers with reporters from 150 countries. When the internet and the explosion of digital news left many newspapers in a desperate scramble for readers and revenue, Arthur invested deeply in digital journalism. Today, the New York Times boasts 2.5 million digital-only subscribers, making it the most successful English-language newspaper website on the planet. The Times 1,300 newsroom staffers cover world events from Manhattan to Myanmar, stressing investigative reporting, using audio and visual tools to deepen readers' experience. During Arthur's time, at the helm, the newspaper has won, and it's a recent update on this, 63 Pulitzer Prizes, I believe. <laughs> Arthur democratized the Times newsroom, put women and minorities into key leadership positions. A devout defender of freedom of the press, Arthur has said, the New York Times, that's my religion. That's what I believe in. He's given millions of readers around the world, like me, a reason to keep faith in the future of quality journalism. Take a look at this. Arthur, we are honored to be able to recognize your fierce advocacy on behalf of freedom of the press during your tenure at the New York Times. Please join me in saluting our Lifetime Achievement Awardee, Arthur Sulzberger.
Thank you. Thank you, John, for that most generous introduction. And also thank you for just taking a moment to honor Barbara Bush on this sad moment. It, it, but it, it is a pleasure to be back here in the museum and with all of you on this very special evening. The museum reminds us that great journalism has many purposes to inform, to enlighten, to challenge, and to surprise. But on occasions like this, as I reflect back on my 40 years at the New York Times, I keep coming back to one purpose, and it's this. The highest and noblest role of a free press is holding power to account. That's been true throughout our nation's history, but it's especially important to remember today. So I'm gonna use this opportunity to share some notes from the field, some stories about when I and those at the times who came before me stood up to presidents and powerful interests. Now my goal is not to brag or to wax nostalgic. God knows the times has not always gotten it right. But in a room full of people committed to the fundamental quest for truth, including, if I might, make a shout out to some of my New York Times colleagues here who uh, have really done great honor to the Times in the last 12 months and longer. Um, the truth is, my hope is that our, my words will inspire all of us to continue the extraordinary work that is being done to continue fulfilling our profession's democratic responsibilities to exposing wrongdoing and calling out abuses of power. Not long ago, I tried to stress this imperative to someone who hasn't always been keen on the idea of a free press. On November 22, 2016, exactly two weeks after Donald Trump stunned the world by winning the presidency, I arranged for him to come to the Times, uh, you saw the photo, to come to the Times for his first on-the-record interview as president-elect. And the day began inauspiciously. At 6.16 a.m., Trump announced on Twitter that he was canceling the interview with, quote, the failing New York Times because he, had, he said we had changed the ground rules. There was no truth to that. After hours of back and forth, at 10.40, he tweeted the interview was back on. By the time the afternoon was over, he had praised the Times as a great, great American jewel. It was truly a dizzying day. Just prior to sitting down with our journalists, the President-elect and I had a brief one-on-one -on -one conversation, and as I walked him into our boardroom where our reporters and editors waited to ask him tough questions, I said, Mr. Trump, you'll notice when we walk into the boardroom that we have many signed photos on the wall, including every president since Teddy Roosevelt. But I'm going to, I want to draw your attention to one photo in particular, not because of the picture, but because of what he wrote underneath to the New York Times. Some read it and like it. Some read it and don't like it. But everybody reads it. Signed, Richard M. Nixon. I then said to the president-elect, that was the last president who took on a free press. Think how it ended for him. With that, we walked into the boardroom and the first on-the-record interview of the Trump era began. Now, I cannot say whether that message registered, <laughs> but I can say that the New York Times and our 1,500-strong newsroom, when you include newsroom and editorial, is working every day to find the truth and share it with the world. Our task is not to be supplicants courting access, which is why the Times pulled out of events some events a while back here in, in Washington, nor is it our job to be the voice of the resistance. 
Our job is to report the facts without fear or favor, and that's been our mission for 165 years, no matter which party has been in power. During John F. Kennedy's first year in office, the Kennedy administration was bullying our new White House correspondent, giving him evasive answers, not being forthright, not being respectful of the press's prerogatives. So Scotty Reston, our legendary Washington bureau chief, called up Ted Sorensen, one of President Kennedy's closest advisors, to defend the reporter. Sorensen would have none of it. He brusquely told Reston that the Times needed to know our place. We do know our place, Scotty coolly replied. We were here before you got here, Ted, and we'll be here long after you're gone. That lesson was on my mind during what was perhaps the highest stakes meeting in, of my tenure as publisher. In the spring of 2004, a whistleblower revealed to the Times shocking details of the Bush administration's secret program to spy on American citizens without a warrant. The White House pressured us not to publish the story, saying it would cost lives and invite another terrorist attack. And with the memory of 9-11 so raw for all of us, there was no easy answer. But after a year of holding our story, we decided that in the final calculus, the nation had a right to know the truth. We informed the administration of our plans to publish our story on the secret NSA program. President Bush responded by playing his final card. He summoned me, our executive editor, Bill Keller, and our Washington bureau chief, Phil Taubman, to a tense Oval Office meeting on December 5, 2005. We were told that if we ran the story and there was another terrorist attack, the Times would be complicit. I was told, in effect, you, Arthur Sulzberger, will have blood on your hands. But after the meeting, standing on Pennsylvania Avenue, Bill, Phil, and I made the decision that Americans needed to know their civil liberties were being violated. We concluded that while we must always take concerns about national security seriously, in this case, we had a duty to reveal the truth. Now, the Times learned that lesson the hard way. In 1961, we got wind of the Kennedy administration's secret plan to invade Cuba. But rather than run the story prominently on page one and reveal the invasion's imminence, my uncle, Orv Dreyfus, who was then publisher of the Times, made the difficult decision to dial back the story. Orv's intentions were absolutely right. He was concerned for the safety of men preparing to risk their lives on the beaches of Cuba. But with the benefit of hindsight, even President, President Kennedy said the Times made the wrong call. In a letter, JFK said that if we had run the story as originally planned, the Bay of Pigs operation might have been canceled and disaster averted. Throughout my years as publisher, the episode, that episode served as a somber reminder that the commitment to holding power to account could be the difference between life and death. Resolving the tension between national security and the public's right to know often makes for tough calls. And when it came to the publication of the Pentagon Papers, my father, Punch Sulzberger, never wavered in his journalistic courage. Our lawyers warned Punch that if he released these documents chronicling decades of government deception and wasted carnage, he himself could be hauled to jail and the New York Times could be visited by financial ruin. But Dad was undeterred. Even after the Justice Department threatened suit, he continued to publish the papers, believing in his bones the world needed to know about the government's lies. Not only was the publication of the Pentagon Papers my father's proudest moment, I can think of no decision that better captures our profession's shared values. And let me also take this moment to congratulate Kay Graham and the Washington Post for her courage in picking up that story when the courts blocked the Times from continuing to publish.
Who knows, that might make a good movie. Of course, the responsibility to hold power to account isn't confined to the political realm. As journalists, our task is to smoke out wrongdoing wherever we find it. And this means reporting aggressively no matter who the subject of the story is, whether a foreign leader, a business titan, or yes, an advertiser. No relationship, no amount of advertising revenue, no threat of retaliation comes before our journalistic mission. During my 40 years at The Times uh, and quarter century as publisher, our company and our profession has changed in dramatic ways, often at breakneck speed, but our values remain immutable. These values shared by so many of the nation's great news organizations represented here are critically needed today. Around the world, powerful forces are sowing seeds of distrust in the news media, from Russia to Egypt to Turkey to China and, of course, to the United States. Journalism is under attack. Too often, journalists risk their freedom and, in some cases, their lives to report the truth. It's up to all of us in this room to fight for press freedom, to stand tall in defense of truth and trust, as Tom Friedman said with characteristic eloquence in a recent Times column, and in defense of our prof profession's responsibility to hold power to account. I consider that my life's work. But I also know that Scotty Reston's words are as true today as they were 50 years ago. Great journalism was around long before I got here. And looking out at the faces of this room, especially those of, of the reporters being honored tonight for their groundbreaking work exposing sexual abuse, I know you will continue holding power to account long after I'm gone. So thank you again for this wonderful honor. Thank you, Arthur. Um, well, it's, a, it's also a great pleasure to get to introduce our next presenter for the evening. He is the NBA's all-time leading scorer, a sports star for the ages, a New York Times best-selling author, a true champion, and one of my heroes, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Good evening, everyone, and uh, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, it's re I'm really happy and proud to be here at this moment to int introduce two very fine gentlemen uh, that I've known for 50 years now, at least, and uh, just to give them their due. Um, they sacrificed a lot. They put in a lot of work over the years, uh, standing up for the right thing and um, making um, activism, something that uh, people could relate to in a positive way. Dr. Tommy Smith and jo Dr. John Carlos earned a place in sports history by winning the gold and bronze medal, gold and bronze medals, respectively, in the 200 meter race at the 1968 Olympics. But they earned a place in civil rights history with their dramatic protest on the medal podium in Mexico City. As the men walked to the podium, they removed their shoes to symbolize poverty. They wore beads to represent lynching victims. As the Star Spangled Banner played, Tommy and John bowed their heads and raised their gloved fists in a defined demand for human rights that echoed around the world. Their protest against the unjust treatment of black Americans and people of color everywhere was a watershed moment in civil rights history. But the glare of global attention was harsh. The men were booed and banished from the Olympics. Returning home, they received death threats and struggled to find work. Both men had brief careers in professional football. Tommy became an educator, coach, and civil rights activist. John worked for the US Olympic Committee and became a high school counselor and coach. 
In 2008, John carried the human rights torch to draw attention to China's human rights abuses ahead of the Beijing Olympics. That same year, he and Tommy won the Arthur Ashe Courage Award. The courageous actions Tommy Smith and John Carlos took 50 years ago continue to inspire activists today. I can remember that time because, uh, you know, it, it was a time when a lot of us didn't feel very patriotic, ha having had to endure the assassination of Dr. King. But we still had enough positive thoughts about our country, about the U.S. of A, that we decided that we would stay and try to make it work. Let's take a closer look at the lives of two champions of the First Amendment, Dr. Tommy Smith and Dr. John Carlos. <laughs> it is a triumphant moment, folks. Sadness for our country, loss of a great lady, the Bush family. We give our condolences. I'm pretty sure that all of us will agree it is a time of resilient thought. Let us not forget. Hmm. Thank you, Corrine, for bringing us up here. To the museum, of course, its committee, I, Tommy Smith, stand before you this day and, of course, grateful for this particular platform. There's one I can identify like this, but there was a two or three more people in the stands and are here. This, a social identification of those freedom fighters, past and present, who have toiled through the inclemency of weather and war so we can see, we can have warmth, we can have comfort and peace, and stand today with, without the burden of visible change that was once a highlight of audacity and abomination. Free expressions must be a continuous sound, my people, through education, because overcoming is not a dead issue. In the face of adversity, the struggle continues. Now, there's many of us look for comfort in non-involvement. But see, you can run, but you cannot hide. Please order my steps in your way, dear Lord. And the steps to that bridge must be continuous to magnify his glory, bridging the gaps of spiritual, civil and cultural awareness, which are steps to the future. A battle is never won if first you don't engage. Then, and only then, staying on the battlefield must not have rival options. The glory of the audacious noises we must hear continuously are the footsteps on social bridges being crossed, and the next bridge would not be a challenge if that bridge had no meaning to why it must be crossed. Freedom of expressions are not new. Only the people crossing the bridges are new. And don't you even think about looking around and trying to imagine who those new people are. Your seat is filled with at least one to rise up to your victory 
and stand and make a difference to the news museum, I thank you highly for this contribution to the future. And yeah, I got gray hairs and you can see me with gray hairs. And some of you will have gray hairs also tomorrow. Thank you. Good evening. I'd like to thank the new museum for this honor. Uh, I heard Mr. Arthur get up here and make some statements about the New York Times. And uh, I'd like to say, you know, when I started my adventure as a youngster in New York, met up with Mr. Smith and grew up with Kareem in New York, and started my tour. And I was concerned about humanity as a youngster. As an old man, I'm still concerned about humanity. But I remember my father was in the First World War, and my father was getting ready to move on to the law. And I went to the hospital to visit him at the Veterans Hospital in New York. And my father said to me, he said to me, he said, son, why did you do all those bad things? And I looked at my father. What are you talking about, Pop? He said, go look in the drawer over there and get that newspaper. And I got the newspaper out, and it was the New York Times. And I read the article, and they were talking about individuals such as H. Rap Brown, Stokely Carmichael, Professor Harry Edwards, and my cohort, Tommy Smith. And I looked at my dad, and I said, Dad, uh, what are you implying that I did something bad, I did something wrong? And he said to me, he said, well, look what they're saying about you. And I thought right away, if my dad is saying this, imagine what the people that don't know me, what they're thinking about John Carlos or Tommy Smith or Peter Norman for that matter. And I remember saying to my dad, I said, Pop, do you know H. Rap Brown? He said, no, son. Do you know Stokely Carmichael? No, son. Do you know Professor Harry Woods? No. Do you know Tommy Smith? No. I said, do you know John Carlos? He said, come on, son. I said, no, daddy, do you know John Carlos? I said, because the same thing they're writing about the other people that I've mentioned, they're writing about John Carlos. No one on the planet should know John Carlos better than you. Is that your son that they're writing about? This was the Times. It wasn't just the LA Times or the New York Times, it was all the papers across this country that had no consciousness for people of color. They heard everybody's story about people of color, but they never went to people of color to get the true story. And I sat there and I looked at my father and I said, God, if they could have my father believe this, we're in trouble because society, they look at headlines, and they draw their conclusions based on headlines rather than trying to learn an individual or his culture. You know, it's tough to stand up and say, I want to fight for my right to survive in this society, but it's even tougher when you want to stand up and fight for those that can't fight for themselves. Now sit back, you know, I want to introduce my grandson. Stand up, Miles. Let me just say this, I didn't introduce him for applause because we don't, in my family, we don't even like applause, okay? But I introduced my grandson to make a statement that when I did what I did at 23 years old, I wasn't concerned about me, I was concerned about my son, my son's kids, to make sure that someone is standing there to make sure that they have an equal opportunity to be successful. So I was hurt about the. New York Times and the New York Post and the Daily News and the LA Times. But here at 72 years old, now I can sit back and say, it looks as if though through Arthur's statement that the Times had made the curve. 
a lot more papers now, a lot more understanding about the plight of people in society, all human beings, regardless of what your ethnic background is or your economic worth. It's about your heart and your soul and your spirit. The question I asked myself one day, I said, if I see a white man fall down on the ground, based on the history that I know of this country, should I be compelled to ignore this man fighting to survive or to exist in this world and not lend a hand to give him oxygen or pump on his chest? Or should I just merely walk away because of the things I was taught as a young man to be biased and prejudiced based on the man's religious or the creed of his color? This is the question that we have to ask. I'm not here to accept an award for myself. I don't even like awards like I don't like applause. But my kids tell me and my wife tell me, say, you have to accept it, Daddy, because we have to feel good to see you go up there and receive an award because you've done some good things in your life. I didn't do them for awards. I did them to make that connection with you, to make sure that you understand what your roles are in life. I shouldn't have to go out there and stick my fist to the sky. I didn't ask to be no model in society. I want to be just like you, groove and move just like you. But somebody got to take the forward step. I honor Mr. Smith. I honor Kareem. I honor Kaepernick. I honor Michael Bennett and all those individuals that stood by him and supported him. And just as I see so many white folks in this audience, I just want you to remember these things. There was a man named Frederick Douglass that lived in this town years ago. We commemorate Frederick Douglass. But remember, Frederick Douglass had a cohort named John Brown. People seem to have forgot about John Brown. I don't know whether they forgot about him because he was white, but they forgot about him. Fifty years ago, I stood on a podium with two individuals, Tommy Smith and another blue-eyed white guy by the name of Peter Norman. They did the same thing to him that they did to John Brown. They tried to whitewash him, wipe him out of history like he didn't exist. And then you look back at modern day with young Mr. Kaepernick taking a knee. He wasn't the only one to take a knee. They had some white individuals that took a knee and took their hand and put it on his shoulder and said, I lend support to you. They whitewashed all those white football players too to show you that you should not have moral character within your soul and your mind and your spirit to say, I don't care about what your ethnic background is. I don't care about what your economic state is. I, all I care about is whether you're doing the right thing and God is telling me to support you. It's your turn to step up. It's your turn to get up on the podium one day where I can say, hey, let's get a trophy, let's get a medal, let's give it to them because they deserve it. God bless you, and thank you for giving me this opportunity. Please welcome to the stage our next presenter for the evening, Kathleen Carroll, board chair of the Committee to Protect Journalists and former executive editor and senior vice president of the Associated Press. Good evening. The name of our next Free Expression Award winner was kept secret until now to protect his safety, and you'll see why. Just over three years ago, two masked terrorists shot their way into the Paris office of the French newspaper, Charlie Hebdo. Laurent Sorisseau, the, the cartoonist known as Ries, survived by pretending to be dead. In all, 12 people were killed that day, eight of them his colleagues, including his co-editor, Stéphane Charbonnier. Ries was shot in the shoulder, but from his hospital bed, he produced four, four cartoons for the survivor's edition of the newspaper published just a week after the attack. 
Now, Charlie has long been known for its searing satire of religion and politics. The terrorists targeted Charlie because it had published cartoons caricaturing the Prophet Muhammad, founder of Islam. That day, January 7, 2015, changed many things for Reese and his surviving colleagues. They have endured physical and emotional trauma and constant threats. Many live with 24-hour police protection. After the murders, millions of people marched under the banner, Je suis Charlie, I am Charlie, and circulation rose for a while. But today, that is tapered off, and Charlie struggles under financial pressure. Yet one thing has not changed, one important thing. Reese and his staff continue to puncture the powerful and the pompous in fierce defense of the fundamental right to free expression. Let's take a look at the fearless work they do. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. In Charlie, Charlie Hebdo's name, I'd like to thank you for this honor first. Making a magazine is never easy, and perhaps Charlie Hebdo is even harder. To keep our editorial independence, we always refuse advertising. Charlie lives only by its readers. Plus, Charlie has always published text on cartoons that other magazines did not dare to print. Over the years, this approach has, how you say, landed us in the doo-doo quite a few times. <laughs> the name Charlie Hebdo itself was created to avoid a ban on our previous magazine, which did not show the necessary respect when General de Gaulle died. Charlie Hebdo was born from an act of, of political censorship. In the 70s, the French army often sued Charlie Hebdo for anti-militarism. In the 19s, it was hardline Catholics who sued us for being rude about Christianity. For the last 20, 20 years, Charlie Hebdo has confronted a new absolute, a new form of the arbitrary. One we believe was no longer part of our democracies. Religious powers and religious violence. You know how that ended for us. Yet in all this time, Charlie hasn't really changed. I never thought the job of a press cartoonist would be comfortable, even in France. Because when you have something to say, there is always someone somewhere with a very good reason to stop you from saying it. Freedom does not really exist. You can't buy it or sell it. Freedom is a creation of the human spirit. Freedom is always born from an act of imagination. And if it is not important, then nothing is. If we stop fighting to keep it alive, freedom will disappear. Freedom is not an app for your iPhone. Freedom of press is a long war. It's a lifelong fight. The fallen of Charlie Hebdo gave everything to it. They gave their all. Merci. Please welcome to the stage the presenter for tonight's final award from ABC News, 
Gloria Riviera. Good evening. It's an honor to be here as a correspondent with ABC News and also as a co-founder of Press Forward, a recently launched organization with the support of the museum to ensure safe and secure newsrooms for women and men across the country, which would not exist without the work of the recipients of tonight's final award. Because of the power of the press, shocking revelations about the scale and seriousness of unchecked sexual misconduct in our society have resulted in a monumental cultural shift. What finally started this reckoning and ended this decades-long cycle of abuse was investigative reporting, said the prosecutor in the case of the doctor who was sexually abusing young gymnasts for years, a story tenaciously reported by the Indianapolis Star. Reporters who broke major stories about sexual harassment and misconduct were stonewalled, they were threatened, they were bullied, and worse much like the women whose stories they told. Their work broke through a dam of suppressed stories and silenced voices to reveal decades-long harassment throughout the American workplace, including media, film, sports, manufacturing, the arts, and Congress. They reported stories that were open secrets, but had been shut down in the past by powerful enablers. Tracking down sources around the globe, they gave a voice to victims who went public with tremendous difficulty with their own horror stories of sexual misconduct that ranged from verbal harassment to rape. That reporting spurred resignations and firings of powerful men who had seemed invincible, untouchable. It also unleashed hundreds of thousands to reveal their own stories of abuse on social media under the hashtag we all know now, me too. Backed by the courage of the victims who spoke out, the journalists' work inspired a movement for transformative change. Let's take a look at the reporters who changed our national conversation about sexual misconduct in the workplace. Please join me in celebrating tonight's final honorees of the night, the journalists whose reporting uncovered sexual abuse and misconduct in workplaces across the country. The following journalists represent all the journalists who sought to shed light on this long silenced issue. From the New York Times, whose investigative reports uncovered sexual misconduct in the media and film industries and across the American workplace, Michael Schmidt and Emily Steele. From the New Yorker, the first publication to disclose allegations of rape and sexual assault against movie producer Harvey Weinstein, Ronan Farrow. From the Indianapolis Star, which investigated the systematic sexual abuse of more than 150 athletes by the former doctor for USA Gymnastics, Mark Alicia, Steve Berta, Tim Evans, and Marissa Kwiatkowski. From the Washington Post, Amy Bertain, Aaron Carmon, Alice Kreitz, Paul Farhi, Stephanie McCrumman, and Beth Reinhard. I, 
I'm Steve Verda from the Indianapolis Star. On behalf of Mark, Alicia, and, uh, and uh, Tim Evans, uh, Marissa Kwiatkowski, uh, Bob Shear, um, thank you very much. This is, this is really a big deal for us. And you guys are a very hard act to follow, I've got to tell you that. But uh, I just want to say that a lot of people have asked us, you know, was it really, how did you get these young girls and women to talk about, I mean, these were sexual assault victims, how did you get them to talk about these really difficult situations? And really, what you have to understand is that it really wasn't all that hard. These women, in some cases, and girls in other cases, knew what had happened to them. They knew the situation, and they w wanted a voice. They wanted to be heard. And uh, the problem wasn't their reluctance to come forward in many cases. It was that the people in power, the people who were raking in the gold, the Olympic gold, didn't want to listen. That's purely it. And so we kind of learned a lesson in that uh, moment. And I think it's one that, you know, a lot of people have said here today that, that is a sign of our times and a sign of the way things uh, happen in this city right here. And that is, you know, if, if we really you know, the, uh, our freedom of speech is really only as strong as, as our willingness to, to listen to each other in this country. And uh, as John Carlos said, you know, there's, there's plenty of groups that aren't being heard. And uh, I think this reporting kind of gives us an idea of what can happen if we just listen. Thank you. Wow, here I am going moments before incredible reporters from the New York Times. It doesn't always go that way. <laughs> I've been strenuously instructed to keep this at a minute, so I'll be brief. I'm in a little bit of a state of shock. A year ago today, I had a story and a body of evidence and a set of obstacles in front of me that made me think it might never see the light of day. And that was a very hard position to be in. I was very afraid that I would let down some sources who had done an incredibly brave and important thing. A lot of you know that this story that I worked on didn't start at The New Yorker. And in the journey there, I saw just how fragile and precious and embattled the truth can be. And I also saw how important it is when the truth is liberated because people stand up for it and refuse to abdicate their ethical duty to make it see the light of day. And it's therefore very meaningful and very emotional for me to be here with all of these fellow reporters, many of whom I knew were banging their heads against the wall trying to make sure the truth would out and inspired me to keep going even at those difficult moments. It's an honor to be here telling the stories of these sources who did so much. You know, one after another, the women who came forward in the Harvey Weinstein story said to me, as they grappled over the months with this titanic decision in front of them, yeah, okay, but if I go on the record, even if I take that leap and face this risk, what difference will it make? We don't live in a world where people like us get hurt, where stories like this get hurt. And that's the nature of sexual violence. A lot of the time it makes people feel invisible and unheard. And I am therefore so, so grateful to these, frankly, badass reporters <laughs> and to all the people in this room who stand up for freedom of press, you know, Kathleen and the Committee to Protect Journalists and the museum, because what you're doing is making sure that that fear those sources had is never the truth and that they do feel seen and they do feel heard and that we can't turn away from the need for change. Thank you so much, everybody.
on behalf of reporters for the New York Times, I want to thank the museum for this great honor. We are so humbled and overwhelmed with gratitude and just really struck by, by the power of recognizing these stories and the power of these stories. Our deepest thanks really goes to the sources who picked up the phone when we called, opened the door when we knocked, and decided to go on the record after I showed up at a Pilates class. <laughs> I've talked to a lot of those sources today to thank them for sharing their stories, and they all remarked how astounded they were that those nuggets of information that they shared became a part of a story that was really bigger than any of us. We are astounded by their bravery. We're also astounded by our team of editors who encouraged us to really follow the facts and follow the money to create this solid foundation of reporting that let women tell their stories and also be believed. They really recognize the power of this story. It's also a great joy to be here tonight to recognize Arthur Salzberger. It's almost a year to the day today that Bill O'Reilly was ousted after the investigation by Mike Schmidt and I exposed a series of sexual harassment payments involving allegations against him. That day, Arthur rushed down the stairs and he shook my hand, beaming with pride, really about the power of journalism and the power, about, the power of holding people in positions of power to account. What a whirlwind year of extraordinary reporting it's been. We've just all been in awe as we've seen story after story after story after story and powerful man after powerful man and powerful man be held to account. Arthur, we want to thank you for holding journalism's loftiest ideals really, really up and, and, and that power of holding powerful men to account and giving a voice to those who have been silenced. Thank you for continuing the legacy of the first family of American journalists. Good evening. I am honored to accept the museum's Free Expression Award on behalf of my incredible colleagues at the Washington Post. Stephanie McCrumman, Beth Reinhard, Alice Kreitz, Paul Fari, and Erwin Carmone. We would first like to congratulate the remarkable journalists from the New Yorker, the Indianapolis Star, and the New York Times, whose powerful stories chipped away at a wall of silence that has existed for far too long. The road to the truth can be a very long one. Our colleagues were able to unearth secrets about Roy Moore that have been kept for nearly 40 years. My co-reporter, Erin Carmone, first learned of allegations of sexual harassment by Charlie Rose in the year 2010. Erin worked to get the story on the record back then, but she fell a little bit short. But Erin kept her notes. She kept those notes because she believed that the story was still worth fighting for. And she believed that somehow, some way, someday the story would see the light of day. That day came seven years later on November 20th, 2017, when our investigation into Charlie Rose's sexual misconduct was published in the Washington Post. These stories require a dogged and relentless pursuit of the truth, a meticulous attention to detail and transparency, a commitment to sensitivity and fairness, and above all, an unwavering drive to carry these stories from silence and darkness into a place of light where the truth can be both seen and heard by all. On behalf of the Post, we thank you. So this has been a powerful evening, and um, I hope you were as inspired as I was by the incredible examples and the stories of the First Amendment in action. And if you were, you must help the museum in our fight 
for free expression and a free press and the First Amendment. Please go to museum.org to show your support. We want to thank you for coming. Thank you for the support for the museum tonight. Thanks for standing up for a free press and the First Amendment. Go upstairs and say hello to our award winners, some remarkable people. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We'll see you next year. Good night.